Hi there, you're listening to the Bigfoot Society podcast, and I'm Jeremiah Byron. Every week I talk to individuals who have experienced Sasquatch in some way or another, so you won't want to miss an episode. Make sure you're subscribed on the platform that you're listening to and share this episode with a friend. It does not cost a thing, and it helps the show continue to grow. If you'd like to hear Bigfoot Society episodes early and ad-free, you can do so by becoming a Patreon supporter or a YouTube channel member. Links to those are in the show notes. And Bigfoot Society, I've taken far too much of your time so far, so let's get on with the show. All right, Bigfoot Society, I've got the privilege of talking to an individual who contacted me recently. His name is Philip from the Southeast Georgia area, specifically Savannah. And how's it going today, Philip? It's going well. How you doing, Jeremiah? Oh, I'm I'm doing great. I'm excited to to be able to chat with you tonight. We're having a nice night in central Iowa. It's probably one of the last few days where it's going to be up in the 70s, and uh, we're just having a great, great day up here. So that's great. I know I know that it must get a lot more bitter there as the months move towards winter than it ever does here. Absolutely. It's, it, it can get viciously cold up here, probably a lot colder than it gets down in Georgia for sure. But um, yeah, it sounds I have a little bit of info about you, Philip, and it sounds like you have some really interesting stories. But um, is there anything that you would need the listeners to know about you before we start. Uh, I have you start talking about your encounter, what you've experienced with Bigfoot over the years. Yeah. I give everybody a, a brief overview. Um, I was born and raised here in Savannah, Georgia. <clears throat> I got interested in the paranormal in general at a very early age, like about eight or nine. And, uh, my parents, for all their faults, the one thing they seemed to recognize in me was this interest in that. So I was literally getting gifts of books on things like that by the time I was nine or 10. And so I was interested in a wide array of subjects from, uh, you know, spectral anomalies to UFOs. Um, I remember being so enthralled with the story of Spring Hill Jack when I was a kid. And um, just it just moved on from there. For a while, I got taken away from all that as I became a teenager and interested in teenager things. But uh, an event happened uh, in the Okefenokee Swamp in my early 20s, or well, I should say mid-20s, um, that kind of took me back to that area. Then I stepped it all down again, and in the 2000s, um, uh, it, it, interestingly, the Bigfoot subject was brought back home for me um, through the, uh, the Rick, Dwyer, Rick Dyer hoax of 2008, um, which I was fascinated by. I mean, anybody with half of a brain up there would know immediately it was a hoax, but I was enthralled with how this man was able to continually rope people back in. Um, so yeah, that's what got me back into the subject and I've been hooked ever since. And, uh, and so pretty much there we are, as far as this subject goes, I'm a, Married, father of a seven-year-old. Uh, I'm a, I've been a chef most of my life. I run a hot sauce business, and um, other than that, you know, a musician. In, if you if you want, it, I don't know if you want to mention the name of your your hot sauce uh, uh, company. To, yeah, it's, totally it's totally up to you. It's a mouthful. It's a mouthful, but it should be the company's name is a mouthful because. But it should be easy to remember. If you're familiar with the Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, <clears throat> which took place here in Savannah, the book and, and the movie and all that, it's the play on that. It's the Garden of Good and Hot dot com. And all of the sauces that I design are, are the names are plays on things that have to do with that book. So currently the one I'm selling is called Minerva Sauce. And Minerva was like the voodoo priestess in the book and the movie. That's awesome. So, uh, listeners, if you're into hot sauces, uh, definitely check it out. Check out that link. Uh, the whole you brought up the whole Rick Dyer thing for a minute, and it's it's such an interesting. Uh, maybe we'll chat about that later, but uh, it's crazy. I don't know if you're on TikTok or not. 
I'm not on TikTok. I mean, I watch a lot, a lot of TikTok stuff, but I'm not actually a member. He's on there and he's, uh, he's starting stuff up again on TikTok because it's a brand new really? audience. Too. Oh yeah. You should check it out. It's, it's wild. I will definitely, I will definitely look that up. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, and supposedly he's getting a team together and they're going to go out and find Bigfoot again, but this time, you know, they're going for it and it's, it's, it's very interesting to watch it kind of, you know, history tends to repeat itself. Uh, usually these things, yeah. you know, all you got to do is you got to wait 10 or 15 years with, with Bigfoot right. and People it's enough forget time quickly. to forget. Yeah. That's exactly right. We all have big forgetters now. Um, everybody was worried in the future. We'd all be thrown under the bus if we, it, which is true, but then within, your comeback can come within a year because people were just on to the next victim by that point. <laughs> Absolutely. And like, I mean, take for example, the whole like Justin Smeha, like, you know, a uh, Bigfoot yeah. incident out, out in the Sierras, I believe. I mean, like no one really remembers that anymore. And it's just, it's, it's wild. No, it's amazing how that's not that, you know, that's not that far back, but in terms of people's ability to keep things going in their memory anymore, it's, it's a, it's an eon ago. It is. And, you know, who knows what's to blame for that? Probably all the stuff we've been gone through the last few years, or maybe it's our culture with we've got so many different things coming into, you know, from our devices that we just, we forget easier. Exactly. Who knows? But, our attention spans have been shortened and we're, you know, I remember one time I posted something that was literally just on Facebook of my own just thoughts about a certain subject. And it might've been three or four paragraphs. And there were people literally going, good God, how long is this thing going to go on? You know, it's, so that, I think you're right. That has a lot to do with it is, is just where we're going in terms of communication. Yeah. It's, it's pretty wild, but, but take me back to the first time that you had some sort of uh, encounter or some, interaction uh with bigfoot where does our our story begin with what you experienced okay. is it okay jeremiah if i real quickly take people back to what i specifically had interest in bigfoot just absolutely. for a second oh yes absolutely okay when i was you know a kid i don't remember seven or eight years old something like that my parents took me to this movie i think it was called the great waldo pepper which starred robert redford something about a pilot during World War One or some, something like that. It's been so long, I couldn't really be sure. But back then, we didn't just have movie trailers. They would have cartoons and uh, shorts, movie shorts. And there was a short movie about Bigfoot. I had never heard of the subject ever. Of course, not surprising being that age. And um, I don't think I remember hearing any of the Sierra Sounds vocalizations, though some of them would have would have been recorded by that point, obviously. Um, but I remember hearing what now in my memory sounds like, like the Ohio screams, Ohio howls, and seeing the Patterson footage. And I just remember I was just immediately gripped. Like part of me was afraid, but I was also so enthralled with this. And it just had this dead certainty, even at that age, that there was some truth going on here, even though I'd never been exposed to it. And I remember thinking because that, they were talking about the Pacific Northwest, of course. That's all they were talking about back in the, those days, 70s, 80s. And uh, I just remember thinking, well, there's mountains in Georgia. Because I was just thinking in terms of mountains then. And we, we realized that's not even accurate only, you know. But I just kept thinking there's mountains in Georgia. I bet they're in Georgia. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like I said, eventually that faded away. So I moved to Athens, Georgia. I was kind of doing the music thing during the 90s. And um, I kind of was, I guess, longing for some male bonding. You know, I just uh, wanted to get a bunch of guys together, go camping, you know, get some beer, try to fish, even though we were all poor anglers. We had plenty of ground beef for burgers because we knew we probably wouldn't be growing fish. And that was very true, as it turned out. We did this for a few years. You know, I kind of rounded up a whole troop of guys, like about maybe 12, 15 guys. And we did it for like three years. And if my memory serves me correctly, it was the middle year was 1996. And this was down in the Okie Finoki Swamp. Were you familiar with that? Yes, I, I've heard of that swamp before. Yeah. Okay, it's far south Georgia, and even part of it goes down into Florida. 
And it's the only place of its kind in all of uh, the United States. Um, it is very swampy, although technically it's it's considered a watershed. But when you go in there, it's just primordial. You know, it's it's the black water, the cypress trees, the uh, Spanish moss just dripping off of everything. And, you know, uh, huge blue herons that almost look like miniature pterodactyls flying around. Gators everywhere. There's loads of bear, loads of hog, loads of deer. And anyway, I was uh, the first day we decided to take all the canoes out, you know, rent these canoes there and um, just go out in the canoes. And we thought maybe the second day we'd rent motorboats so we could get further up into the swamp. So that first day I was with my, I will name him by his first name. I have tried to find this guy on social media and have not been able to. He was my roommate and a pretty close friend at the time named Bob. And Bob and I got into a canoe and went off on our own. And the main lake down there in the area off of Fargo, when you go up to this <clears throat> Stephen Foster State Park, is called Billy's Lake. And it really looks like this very long, just kind of wide river. And then off of Billy's Lake are all these much narrower tributaries that shoot off. And we had gone off, we'd probably gone a mile down Billy's Lake and then gone north up a tributary. And, it, you know, been so long, but I'm guessing we probably went even though these things get narrow, they just keep winding, and occasionally they'll open up again. And <clears throat> we went up maybe a couple of miles up this tributary, and we were coming back down, and we were getting pretty close to where we would hit Billy's Lake again, to which we would have to then take a right to go back to our destination. But before we got there, I would guess that the tributary was probably 80 to 100 feet wide at this point, and we were pretty much dead center. And off to the right and ahead of us, and it's a real hard guess about how far ahead of us, we were hearing a bunch of commotion off of the bank, um, splashing in the water and stuff. And we, there's a lot of, when you, I'm sure you've seen this kind of landscape. There's all these cypress trees and cypress knees, but in this area, there's a lot of other thicket there too, including uh, yawpon holly and stuff like that. And of course, all the moss. And so we're, both paying attention, Bob's in the front, I'm in the back, we're looking over there, and I start going through this catalog in my mind of what it could be. My first thought was, it's an alligator at the bank, you might be catching a fish. And then uh, every other large animal that I could think of went through my mind, a deer, a hog, or a bear. It sounded too big, really, to be. I know that small animals can make a big rock, just like raccoons and stuff, but it really just, in my to my ears, it sounded too big to be something like a, like a raccoon. And they're typically not out, as you know, in the daytime. And we're getting closer and closer. And we so we get to where we're pretty much perpendicular to this area on the bank where the sound is happening. And at a guess, about 40 to 50 feet away from the bank. And this thing just stands up. And as it's standing up, it turns around with it so that it's now like it's turning to to turn away from us so that I get a glance of it turning and then just moving deeper into the trees. Very, it, I got this feeling overall that we had disturbed it. I don't know if it was getting a drink of water or trying to catch a fish, <clears throat> but the main thing um that struck me is there were shoulders and i could see 40 feet is not that far i could see hair but i could see through the hair to kind of a gray almost like really like kind of a brownish it was like the hair was brown and even the skin looked kind of brown slump shoulders but very you know very like this thing wasn't like built like patty it was more ropey um, but to me, my just, I just saw these shoulders and I just, you know, bears don't, everything has some degree of shoulder, I guess, but they don't have these visible shoulders. I never got to look at the face because it turned. The thing that struck me <clears throat> more than anything else was probably that as it moved away from us, it just appeared so smooth. It looked like it was gliding back into the woods. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, we were drifting away and having a WTF moment. 
And uh, somebody, when I told him about it much later, said, why didn't you go back? Like, I had no thought about going back. We'll be back with more Bigfoot Society after these words from our sponsors. And, you know, at that point, I wasn't into the subject to the point because it had gotten away from me and I didn't expect this to happen. So I didn't think, oh, go back and look for tracks. Not to mention, I was pretty freaked out. So was he. Bob was super freaked out. So we're trying to talk about what we saw. And then we realize as we get back, we're going back to camp. There is no possible way we can talk about this with the gang because they will rip us to shreds. So we made this agreement. We weren't going to talk about it. We're just going to try to do, you know, the rest of the, uh, the camping trip with the guys and have fun. And the thing is, Bob and I rode down there together. It was multiple cars. Some of, some of my friends were meeting me from Savannah and the rest of us were coming down from Athens. And so Bob and I had gone down together. I kept trying to bring it back up in the car on the way back up. And he, it was just clear that he did not want to talk about it. Like you, you know, just these pat little short answers. Like, yeah, that was weird. And not going on anymore until I got the message. It's like, he does not want to go there. And from that point forward, I tried a few more times as we still were roommates and he didn't want to talk about it. It really upset him. I'm not saying it didn't freak me out. Of course, I was more like, wow, you know, this is, you know, crazy. And I wanted for so long afterwards, after Bob and I were no longer, you know, together as roommates, um, I wanted to, I wanted, because, you know, memory can do weird things. You would think, well, that's going to be indelibly imprinted. But there are other things that I have remembered that since I was a child that I was dead certain were the way they were. And then I would share them with another family member or something. They go, no, no, that didn't go down like that. So your remember is always kind of re-editing things. And I needed Bob to be able to verify what I thought had occurred. And I, you know, that's never happened. But still, it was like, you know, I don't want to say, hey, because it's been so long. I know I saw a Bigfoot, but I know I saw something that was moving upright was powerfully muscled, ropey. It wasn't eight or nine feet tall in my memory. It might have been six, six and a half feet tall. And it looked like it was on skates or something moving back into the woods until it just disappeared very quickly. It wasn't running, but it didn't take any time to get out of sight. And the funny thing is how much commotion it originally had made. And then it just seemed like it just silently went back into the woods. And that's including stepping on, you know, a foot of water because that in those swamps the water just doesn't necessarily disappear at the bank you know it just everything stays really low so you're still splashing around in water for who knows how long before you get onto dry completely dry land so that was that <laughs> um but the thing is i had to stuff it down because i couldn't really share it um and there wasn't an open community even then like there is now we you know i didn't have a computer in 96 um they were getting started of course but there was just nobody to talk with i had a lot of good friends but none of them were into any of this stuff none of it and they were always like uh phil's that conspiracy guy they were already laughing about me talking about cattle mutilations and stuff like that back then you know so i just had to stuff it down and and try to forget about it again not that i really did forget about it but i did move on with my life from that point when you saw the creature like moving away from you, what kind of emotions did that, did you feel inside when, when you saw that? Well, uh, more, more than fear. I'll be honest with you. I, even though I was overwhelmed, I never felt like there was any kind of, I didn't think I would have the guts to go back and try to get on land. If I had thought of, if I'd even thought about that, but I was just, there was this, this incredible, like, holy crap, this has just landed. I wasn't even asking for this, and it's just landed in my lap. It was this overwhelming emotion of, in a way, it was kind of validating the fact that all this stuff is stuff I've been into, but have never really had any validation for it. I've just known about it through books and stuff. And so it was powerful for me in a, in a lot of ways, not the ultimate fear that I saw my roommate going through, but... It, it, and so that was the immediate emotion was just, it was just beyond like, 
it kind of rips your head open. Like it's, how do you, how do you process this? This is nothing in my experience. Even if I've ever been into this subject, which as a kid I was, you're just not prepared to have your world ripped open by something you don't understand that completely just, you know, comes along out of nowhere. I think possibly too, the only reason it occurred is because the water was glass smooth and we weren't paddling fast. We were just drifting. So we weren't even making noise. And as a matter of fact, if my memory serves me correct, it stood up when we dropped our paddles down across the boat. Those, these were aluminum canoes and it made that made a big sound. And that's when all this happened. Um, Cause as I'm sure you're aware of, these things are like the ninjas of the forest and sneaking up on one of them is almost impossible. I've always thought it was Patty just taken off guard. I know a lot of people say she was running cover for youngins. I don't know the truth of that. Um, I thought that could be the one in 10 million chance that one of these things is taken off guard, you know? So yeah, head was totally blown. And then of course, for the rest of the, I, you know, I did do my best to have a good time, but I couldn't get my mind off it. And to top it off with that, two nights later, I heard this crazy scream howl in the middle of the night out of my tent. And I just chalked that up to probably be being a fox. And once again, we're going with memory. So it wasn't until years later on the internet that I started pulling up because I have foxes here and they do a type of bark but I know they have more sounds of that. And I pulled up every kind of fox sound and cry I could. And in my memory of what I heard did not match that. It was way more powerful, way longer. It did sound almost like a baby crying at certain points. But I, I just kept saying, well, that's a fox. That's just coincidence. That couldn't be another you know situation like I just experienced. But I just remember I couldn't fully be immersed into the guy bonding thing for the rest of the trip because I was just, I wanted to know, to know more at that moment. I hoped that my roommate was going to get all jacked up about it with me and want to find out more. And so that was, in the end, it was a huge disappointment. <laughs> how, how far away, <clears throat> excuse me, how far away from your sighting was your campsite where your tent was? Okay. So let me picture this. So I would guess that uh, where the sighting occurred, if I went back to Google and just looked at it, I could do some guesswork. I would say that where the sighting occurred before we hit Billy's Lake again was probably maybe a quarter of a mile before we got back to the big border. And then we would hang a right. And I'm just out of memory without looking at a map guessing it would somewhere be, be between maybe three quarters to a mile back to dock the boats. And then from there, a hundred yards to the campsite. So a little over a mile maybe, but that's, that's, that's as the canoe moves as the crow flies, maybe a little less. So not out of the question. I mean, you're not that far away. I mean, no, it, you know, and that place is, it's huge. And so yeah. if you look at it from that perspective, this, incident was really close to now it was on the other side of billy's lake but uh, i don't think crossing bodies of water is any problem for these things absolutely um, i do know there's a lot of stories right in the pacific northwest of people seeing them swim and like off of vancouver um but i wouldn't have thought about that at the time and of course you know the other thing that's fascinating to me is what are the numbers? Like my, as much as I respect Jeff Meldrum and I completely do, and he brings something to the table that nobody else can. And that's his knowledge of the foot, you know, but I just disagree with the numbers. I just disagree with the numbers thing. Uh, the whole six to 10,000 or whatever it is in all of North America. And, you know, when you say North America, that means Canada, the United States and Mexico. Um, I can't justify the fact that every time I've gone in the last, 11 years up to the Appalachian mountains, every single time I've had experiences or found some type of evidence. Mm. If they were that rare, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be coming across it every single time. Oh, absolutely. Not, did, did you ever look more into see if there's any other uh, thing, Bigfoot related incidents that had happened in the Okefenokee swamp? Yes. So I don't remember the year. It was sometime in the 2000s, I think. 
You can find it on the BFRO um, uh, database, but it's probably, I don't see, Okefenokee is big enough to where there's several different counties mixed in there. Um, part of it's in Ware County. I don't think this would be Ware County. But anyway, I'll I'll look for it. I can send it to you. But it pretty much was a, a couple driving back home, I think, to Florida at night and going down between Homer. I can't remember if it's Homer or Homerville. There's a Homerville <clears throat> up in North Georgia, so maybe it's Homer, Georgia, which that road is the road we take, that highway down to get to Fargo to the entrance of the swamp. <clears throat> and they were um, – they were driving down the road at night and they saw this thing ahead right off the side of the road. It appeared to be eating roadkill and it stood up and it was <clears throat> interestingly, the description of its height and all that, as I recall, and its look was kind of similar to what I could remember seeing. They didn't, they didn't want to stop though. I think it was pretty shocking for them. You know, there's another account that's, you can find it online. It's from like 18... 1829. 29. Yep. You've seen it? I've seen it before. There's like a, it's like a Bigfoot attack or like they see like a uh, crazy... Massive, like yeah. a, you know. And then of course, there's no way that could be wild fantasy, but I will tell you one interesting thing. In that story, these people apparently trek to what they say is like the very deep recesses of the swamp. Well, I was going over Google one time and looking at the area where we would go camping and, and the general area, and then I moved eastward more into the center of the swamp, <laughs> and there's an island called Bugaboo Island. Mm. And Bugaboo is a similar word to like booger. Okay. Maybe nothing there. Maybe nothing at all. But I thought it was kind of interesting. That word has come now, up a, a few times. There's a lot of times. other people that make. What's that? That that word has come up a few times, so not surprising. Yeah. You know, I think there are a lot of other stories from that area, but I don't know if anything's really logged in with the BFRO, which we know is the biggest database, but by no means comprehensive. Exactly, and it's a thing where half of it you can't see publicly, right? <laughs> And um, I also like, I don't know if you, have you looked into the Bigfoot mapping project as well? I think I heard something about this recently, but tell me more about it. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's another great uh, database uh, that uh, one of my friends, Scott is, is uh, running up and it, in, it, it integrates things like the BFRO database, but he has a ton of people sending him reports directly to it and then, He's just a really smart guy when it comes to maps, and definitely I would recommend check that out as well. Oh, cool. So the Bigfoot, I know I've heard about that recently, so I'll definitely look that up. Yep, definitely. Bigfoot map, uh, Bigfoot mapping project, so good stuff. Okay, great. Um, so that, you know, that, I wanted that to get me back into all this, but it didn't because I didn't have anywhere to go with it. Mm. And as we discussed earlier, it was 2008 when I got back into this subject in a most interesting way. Okay. My twin brother called me up going, and he's my twin brother hated for me to talk about Bigfoot. <laughs> he tried to micromanage situations where around relatives he'd be like don't be talking about bigfoot around our aunt stuff like that he was like really embarrassed about it but he called me up one day saying i've got to put it on the news they found bigfoot in georgia and uh, i you know being into the subject or not really being back into it but of course still having it in the back of my mind always <clears throat> i was curious but even then just I get skeptical of stuff like that immediately. So I uh, looked it up on the internet and sure enough, there it was. And immediately when I saw this ice box, <coughs> I was like, this is hilariously bad. And 
I couldn't believe that my brother was so into it because he didn't normally went into the subject, but for some reason, this was proof to him. So then I had to dispel that. But that's what kind of got me, and it's not kind of, it really got me back into the subject, and even into the subject of the anomaly of a person like Rick Dyer who could gain this cult following and to some degree, I'm not saying the guy ever made it rich or anything, but he must have been profiting to some degree off some people's utter devotion to him. We'll be back with more Bigfoot Society after these words from our sponsors. Yeah, there's a, definitely a huge allegedly there that we want to throw out, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's a really interesting story if you look into it and just you know, you look yeah, at and then it culminated in that documentary that uh, mm. that guy was like a probably a, like I think he I'm not sure I don't I don't know that he was an award winning documentary filmmaker, but I think he was had some notoriety. And um, I remember there was a lot of stuff that led up to that. There was that intersection somewhere in Texas where <laughs> there's basically a wooded area in between all these highways. And there's like a homeless encampment in there. And they're talking about a Sasquatch being in this homeless encampment. And I guess that's all part of what led up to the documentary like do you remember blair witch project they had like a whole oh, yeah. documentary on on the uh on the sci-fi channel about the blair witch leading up to the movie's release which really gave it this like it made people think this was even though it was being sold as fiction it was based on a real story and i think that must have been sort of what he may have borrowed from was the idea of interviewing these homeless people and, and, and all this stuff. And then once the movie came out, that was the, uh, cause I remember finding that spot on the, you know, on the map. I'm like, well, that's a, about a hundred yards of woods surrounded by freeways everywhere. Mm. So not that I'm not open-minded to high strangeness when it comes to, in terms of possibilities, I don't embrace anything, but I, I am not like, I am open to very high strangeness. I've ex even experienced a little weirdness myself and it had, as it's come to getting into this subject. Um, but at the time that came out, I definitely would not be open to the idea of a Bigfoot somehow making it into a little green space that's surrounded by freeways on all sides. Sure. So uh, I think the first foray I made it out is the forest after 2008 so it's it's five years of me just looking into everything on the internet finding some of the dominant personalities and all the big stories <clears throat> like we all do and um i made an arrangement to uh go up to north georgia in 2013 with some friends we weren't going to be roughing it we were getting a cabin but the cabin was in a pretty remote area uh, west, no, east, northeast of Helen, Georgia, about seven miles east, and then a little bit north. And, um, you know, it, it was, I found some interesting things. I found my first, I will say my first possible, it was definitely a footprint. The question is whether it was a human footprint. It was on a sandbank uh, on the Soqui River. We left the cabin and then just kind of trekked through the woods. There were no trails, but we found a long abandoned logging road and we started to follow that. And the logging road went right alongside the bottom of the mountain. And so it was sandwiched in between the Sokri River and the mountain. So we knew we can go up as far as this thing stays in between the river and the mountain because we'll know how to get our way back. So we went, back, went probably up a mile or more up this road. And eventually I found a, uh, I found this foot track right on the sandbank by the river. It didn't have any heel impression. It didn't have any tread impression. Um, and it, you couldn't see toes, but where, if there were, would have been toes on this print, there was a lot of sticks and stuff right there. But I did film it. And it was about maybe somewhere between a quarter and a half inch deep in the sand. So I, 
the time I may have, may have weighed about 205 or 10 pounds. So I put my foot <clears throat> not too far next to it and, and not only put my weight down, but tried to actually push into the dirt as hard as I could, which was wet sand. It was like a wet sandy bank. I couldn't get more than a couple of millimeters into the sand. So unless you could argue that when the sand was dry, maybe it was easier to make an impression if it, in, in the very least, it was probably a very heavy human. Um, and so, I, you know, I was pretty excited about that. I also found an industry hair not far away from it, which I promptly lost. I put it in a paper football that I made, stuck it in a book, and then years later decided to go out and find it. Uh, just who knows what I did with it. And even though there were a few other interesting things, that was enough to keep my interest. It wasn't a whole lot, but it was enough to keep my interest peaked. And then I went to the mountains again in 2014 with my wife and my dog to an area I've been several times now, the Fort Mountain area in Georgia. You know where that is, Fort Mountain? I am not familiar with that one. I'm familiar with the Blue Ridge area, but uh, not well, with this Fort is, Mountain. Fort Mountain is literally right below Blue Ridge. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. So you know where the Bigfoot Museum is now? Absolutely, yep. This is just west of that. It's called the Cohutta Wilderness. And then there's Fort Mountain, which is also a state park. Okay. And we got a cabin uh, down a dirt road. Uh, you can still look this cabin company up because I've been there a couple of times. It's called the Wilderness View. And uh, the very first morning we got up, I decided to get up early, let my wife sleep in, go for a walk, take the dog. And we're not we're not off trail or anything. We're we're just on a dirt gravel road, and we're going up the road. And I'm just going around to get a layout and see what I can see. And suddenly, this and I'm just going to say when I say a voice in my head, I don't mean an outside voice. Like there wasn't some, you know, other spirit in my head. It was just a voice in my head, like myself, telling me you need to look down. And I looked down, and there was a triangle right in the middle of the road. And the triangle was fashioned out of one stick. It wasn't three sticks. <clears throat> it was a stick that had two breaks in it, but they weren't enough to make it totally snap. It was still part of the stick keeping it together. And it was perfectly formed into a little triangle. And I found it very curious. So, you know, obviously I got some pictures of that. It could have by chance been a stick that broke and formed itself in a triangle and fell out of the forest, which was... 10 yards, 15 yards away onto the road. I don't know. But then other things started occurring at the cabin. I heard my first wood knock in the middle of the night. So the back of the cabin went down. There was a ravine that went, fell back from the cabin down into like a little creek area. And every night I'd sit on the porch at night late till about three or four in the morning. And I heard my first wood knock. It was just a lone wood knock. It was loud. It sounded like it could have been at least a half mile away and was reverberating through the ravine very lonely sounding and I found my first tree structure when we went up to um, Lake Conasuega. I've never known how to pronounce that. These are like assuming all native names, but Lake Conasuega or Lake Conasuega. It's at the top of a mountain in the Cohutta wilderness. We, I found my first uh, tree structure there and got a, uh, I got a, some, air, some interesting, uh, what I thought later, I got footage of what I believe are a lot of different juvenile tracks in the mud. And I got that on film. I filmed that. I never, I've never had casting material. I never go out like my pack stuff on my case. I find a track. You know, I've got, so I just generally document it. If I've got something with a, you know, phone once again, a little bit more than went on in 13, but enough to intrigue me. And then the next big thing that occurred to me was, in 2017, we got hit by a hurricane here in Savannah in 2016. And then we got another one in 17. And this time we just wanted to get away from the city. And so we, my friend uh, owns a cabin up in Saluda, North Carolina, right on the uh, Green River. And we went up there. And like I did at the, the last trip, the very first the very first morning I got up early, it was barely the sun coming up. The cabin's pretty secluded up in the woods. There are a few other cabins, but this is a place where there are no rentals. And most of the cabins are like vacation homes of the people that own it. And they're not there most of the time. So it's pretty, pretty sparse. But I got up and uh, walked 
uh, what I believe would be east of the cabin into the forest and went in about 60, 70 yards. And I am one of these people that for whatever reason, smart or dumb, I will do tree knocks. And um, I, uh, I, did a, I did a lone tree knock and I got, I was about to walk away because after about 30 seconds, I didn't hear anything. And I was, I was getting ready to start walking back to the cabin. And I heard three very loud tree knocks further east of me. And on the third one, I heard that familiar crack when a tree starts to break. And then it came down and crashed and it shook the ground. It was close enough to where it shook the ground where I was. And uh, that kind of spooked me. So I scooted back off to the cabin. And since then, every time I go up to that place, that cabin, I have not had any sightings, but I've had what I feel is contact with what might be a family group up there. And I've got hours of um, field recorder recordings that I need to sift through and isolate the, the good stuff and get it separated and into a computer. It's just still sitting in my field recorder because I would go... I, I would go up from the cabin a little bit uphill from it. This was an area that I felt just felt this feeling that something was going on up here and finding a lot of interesting tree breaks and things like that. And so I, you know, I started hanging like on the first night I hung up the tree recorder. I, I'm one of these people I'll talk to the woods cause I don't know what I'm dealing with. Right. I don't know. I don't profess to know what, these things are or what you know what i mean and i've got some friends that think there are forest brothers that are here to usher us into some new age of enlightenment i've got other friends that say these things are just pure evil and i just don't really embrace any one thing and i have to go by the idea that these things could be just mostly want to do their thing and be left alone some may be curious about us and some of them may be friendly and some of them may not so anytime i go into the woods i I pretty much, of course, I only have the English language to work with, but I say, hey, I'm here. Out of, you know, I'm coming in peace, basically. I'm just curious. And, um, and so I let them know I was hanging this recorder from a tree. And one of the things I did was I wanted to put it on a branch that was brittle enough. It was strong enough to hold this lightweight field recorder, but brittle enough to wear high enough off the ground to where no raccoon could reach it. And if they climbed up the tree and had to get on the branch to get to it, they would break the branch. Um, and uh, so I, I was, I had my cell phone going at the scene. I was recording with my cell phone. I turned on the recorder. I sat it down in a little bag and tied it off on the tree. And I was talking to the woods saying, I'm just letting you know, this is not a camera. This is, but it does capture audio. You feel silly saying this stuff, but at the same time, I feel compelled to do it. And so I, I was with my wife and, you know, it's nighttime. I've got a flashlight, but I'm not aiming it out in the woods. I'm just keeping it down right in the immediate area below me where I can see what I'm doing. And I said, it'd be really nice if y'all could leave me some sounds. And immediately, almost on the tail of me saying sounds, snap, snap. It wasn't like branches falling or it was like clearly two sticks that were just intentionally snapped so quickly, almost like almost ahead of what I said. And I, we heard it right there in real time. And I could only guess that whatever that snap was, it was less than 30 feet from us. And so then I started walking down the hill and, uh, and then of course later I viewed it and sure enough, there it is. The two snaps are just, it's so, I guess somebody could listen to that and say that was just pure chance, but because of all the other things on the recorder stuff, something touching the recorder and apparently it sounds like scratching the fabric of the bag, the, the woven bag that it's in. And, you know, because this has two stereo condenser mics on it. You know, do you have one of those kind of field recorders? Is it like a task cam? It's uh, well, I had a task cam first. This is a zoom. Oh yeah, sure. Yep. HM1. So same same type of same exact same type of thing. Yeah. So depending on where the way the mic's placed, you can tell if a sound is coming, yeah, you know, like if you put on earphones, if it's moving lat if something's moving laterally through the air, you'll hear it come in the one can and then start to fade into the other and then fade out from the first can. Tons of whatever flying horizontally towards the recorder, and it, you know, because you can hear the leaves. That's how you know it's traveling. You can hear the leaves as it's hitting leaves through the brush. 
and occasionally hitting the recorder and you can see the VU meters totally spike every time. And then the loud tree knocks. I mean, big, big tree knocks. And then, you know, there's one yell. It's the only vocalization I've ever gotten is in the middle of all this, in the middle of the night, there's one yell. We'll be back with more Bigfoot Society after these words from our sponsors. And I just don't know what to make of it because as I said, this is a, there's a few homeowners that live there year round. This is not a rental place. There is a zip line company um, not far away. So you can hear the zip liners during the day, but that shuts down before nightfall. Um, this was at nighttime, way into the nighttime. And you could just hear this yell. I mean, it, and it could be a human yell. It's I'm going to pull the phone away from me and try to imitate it. Okay. All right. So I don't, spike up your recorder there hang on (laughs) Ah! it's pretty much like that and it was but there was it wasn't a company like if it was a bunch of guys guzzling beer you'd think they'd be yeah you know it wasn't any of that it was just this one lone yell uh it just and like i said i need to get in there hook it up uh to my computer and get a good editing program and 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 isolate all this stuff because you know i've heard tons of it uh I've listened to a lot of Christopher Noel's recordings. Mm-hmm. And when I first heard that, I wasn't listening closely. So I thought he was getting all these knocks that closely together. And then I realized he had just isolated everything and condensed it for the good stuff. So you're not sitting and listening to, you know, just the crickets for 10 minutes. Cause there is a lot of that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I could uh, go, there are other things, uh, that I've experienced as, uh, you know, up in the mountains, but I definitely go down here in Savannah. There's an area I go right outside of Savannah um, where I find a lot of tree structures. And interestingly, the other day I went there and there's one spot where, because there's pine forest everywhere in this area, and it's right off the Ogeechee River. But there's an area where all of a sudden the pine forest disappears and it's just oaks and other types of hardwoods. And and there's no undergrowth. Most of this place is a lot of undergrowth. So if you get off trail, you're tangling through a lot of stuff. In this place, there's no undergrowth. The trees are fairly distant apart from each other. So the sun gets in. And so in a way, it's kind of beautiful, but it also has a kind of dark, ominous feel to it. And I've only been back in there once uh, a couple of years ago, and I got kind of a bad, bad vibe in there. So I got out. But I went back in there a few days ago. And leaning up against a tree is about a five foot oak branch. I mean, a pine branch. And there's there's no there's no pine trees anywhere near. The closest pine trees are probably a hundred yards away. <clears throat> and I've in all the four years I've been going into this place, I have never found another human being going. Matter of fact, the very few people that even go to this place, they don't leave the trail. They just walk the trail. They're either doing power walking or they're with their kids. Going, look, can you see the flowers? But I've never seen anybody get off trail, and I definitely have never seen anybody in this weird part of the forest. And so there's this, and to me, sometimes it's that cool kind of subtle stuff that you know most people would walk right by and never give another thought to. Now, there's some pretty crazy tree structures that are literally right off or by the trails. And I can't say that humans didn't do it because they're not, they're pretty big, but they're not on a scale that a human couldn't make it. And that's one thing we all have to consider, that as this topic has gotten more popular, you know we're occasionally getting punked by people, you know? Oh, absolutely. Like, absolutely. <laughs> Some, yeah. I mean, you go to Salt Fork, you know it's happening in Ohio. Yeah, exactly. Really yeah. popular places. You know, it's a good chance if you do a tree knock, there's some dude like, ah, oh, there's a Bigfoot guy. Let's do a tree knock back. Um, and that's something I wanted to ask you about. So... To me, the whole tree structure thing, and obviously the internet probably has a lot to do with it, but you know, we saw like the In Search Of documentary or any of the other things that came about in the 70s and 80s. No, there wasn't the internet so that people could share everything they saw every moment they see it, but I never heard talk of structures back then. I may have seen some stuff about bedding, stuff that looked like bedding made out of foliage, but I never heard about tree structures until like, 2010 mm-hmm. and i found it weird like people are always speculating and 
you know, what do they mean? Like, I don't know what they mean, but I do know that sometimes the fact that you can find them so close to where people will be, are they not put there for our entertainment or is it not put there for, for the purposes of gaining our attention so that they can observe us? That's just one guess I have, because I don't think they're dwellings, these TP structures, you know, mm-hmm. um, especially a TP structure right off of a trail. Of course, that's not going to be a dwelling. So but there are those interesting beddings out they found out in Washington State. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the the nest sites I think are really cool just because yeah. you have you have it so you know, the Olympic project has brought out, you know, primatologists uh from different zoos and the primatologists have pretty much said, Hey, those are like what the great apes will make in our zoos, right? And that alone is is pretty awesome. Um, For me personally, and I mentioned this a few times on the podcast, um, I have yet to see an example of like a a tree structure where I'm like, oh yeah, totally Bigfoot. And it's because of this, because when I was growing up, I lived at a summer camp and we had an outdoor skills week. And for years I would teach, <laughs> I would teach children and uh, high schoolers how to make what's called bushcraft. Um, right. Which is right. very, very similar to like some tree structure stuff. Now the stuff I can't explain is when you have like these huge sticks up in the air And it's like, there's no way a a log could have fallen and lodged itself up between two. I have no uh, way of explaining that. You know, I'm not sure. Yep. Well, yeah, that's a good point. And uh, so my friend, John, who knows I'm into Bigfoot, but I don't know that he is, but he lives up in Maine now. Mm. And he went to some area there and he sent me this picture. So, you know, a lot of trees will fork off at some point, maybe four feet up, maybe eight feet up. They fork into two, two still fairly large sections. Mm -hmm. This tree about eight feet up has so many massive broken branches stacked in the fork going up probably to 14 or 15 feet. Mm. And I said, has there ever been a flood in that area? And he said, no, there's never been a flood here. This is fairly good idea. I up. So, that's so the ones that don't look like structures to me are the more interesting ones. They're not even trying to imitate a structure mm-hmm. or I found a tree break in this place and see, because I've gone to this place so much, I pretty much know the trails and what's off of the trails, like the back of my hand. Now I don't know the whole forest that way because I, I will go off trail into the forest, but I, there's so much of it. You don't know it that well. But the hiking trails I know, and I pretty much, I will recognize things that aren't there that were, or that are there that weren't there the last time. So one time going down this trail, I literally had been there a couple days earlier, and this sapling, and when I say sapling, it's, I don't want you to think of like this six foot tall tree that's a half inch wide. It's probably three inches wide at the base, maybe four, but goes up probably 20 something feet. And a good 16, 17 feet off, it was snapped. And this was not rotten at all. And, you know, you could argue, well, there was maybe a wind event. But the thing is, I'd just been there, and there'd been no wind event up to that point. And even more interesting is, right next to the sapling is a sapling pine tree that literally is no wider than three quarters of an inch or an inch at the most, just within like a foot and a half off of this other sapling. And I pushed it over my pinky. It was so dry rotted. Why wouldn't the wind have just totally knocked that thing down? So that's interesting, like a snap tree that wasn't snapped. Or when you find, now, what do you think about the Colorado Bigfoot stuff? Like, I literally remember seeing a video of his. Where, uh, he's an interesting character. I'm not saying I necessarily am on board with a lot of his thinking. Okay, so. It's just the key. D- sorry, define Colorado Bigfoot stuff, because I thought you were talking about the whole train video thing. No, 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 no. No, this guy, I, I'll just call him Mark. He's been doing it for years. He goes up 11, 12,000 feet. Um, He's definitely an individual, a character. Um, but he he has, you know, he's just trekking. He's not going on any trails. He, if he goes miles in on one day and then finds his way back out. I literally saw him film. 
It was a whole tree that had apparently been ripped out of the ground uh, by the roots and was woven vert like horizontally with the ground woven between other standing trees. And then we're talking a good 70 foot tree. Like there's no machinery up there. There's no like equipment. And then when you look at his videos, there's just so much down tree stuff. It's like there's, there's 10 times down trees for every standing tree. And so many of them, if you look at them, that's the one thing I always look for when I find stuff with a down tree is the root ball at the base. Is there a dead root ball right near where the base of the tree is? And a lot of the stuff he films there is no root balls anywhere. It's, it's almost as if these things have been pulled in and used for later construction. And the arches, the X's and the arches and the things that he finds are on such a massive scale. I've never seen anything like that here in the Southeast. Like they're just, and they're just so numerous. If you have, you may know who I'm talking about, but if you haven't, you got to check out his videos. I actually have, or even just pull up a compilation video. I haven't heard of this guy yet. So I'll have to check him out. Is his username like Colorado Bigfoot or something like that? Or is Colorado Bigfoot is a username. And I okay. just, he probably won't. His, his name is Mark with a C, I think, M A R C A B A B E E L. He has a lot of detractors because they don't like his theories about what these things are. Uh huh. And it to me, it's like, well, I don't have to agree with him about his theories, and I may or may not, but it's just the cameras. It's just what the cameras finding, the video footage. It's in. It's un. It's insane. It's, you know, here I can't say that. Like if I tell you I find a structure, like I'm going to say, well, I don't know whether this was human made or not because everything I've ever found in here could easily be made by a human. You know. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I have to check that out. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, it seems like the Colorado, and th you don't even see this up, in, at least in terms of the people that I follow, the structure stuff in the elevations of Colorado and Utah, for some reason, are just on a scale that's completely different than almost any other area that I've seen somebody film. Mm. Maybe some interesting things like that in Arizona and stuff, too, though, or New Mexico. Um, but... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it, but it's it's right there on the camera. He's he's filming, and you're watching, and you're just so. Oh my God, I've never seen this kind of scale of down trees and loops and arches, and X structures and X structures on top of X structures. It's just it's absolutely insane. Well, I mean, um, listen, listeners, if you if you've watched this guy, let me know in the comments what you think about uh, what you see on his channel, what you think about the stuff he's. Uh, Filming could be some interesting conversation, but, uh, uh, Philip, it's been, it's been a fun chat, man. I don't get to do a lot of, uh, Georgia episodes, but man, you guys have some really interesting things going on out there. Yeah, I think so. And I, you know, I, I, even though I think it's also happening down here in Southeast Georgia, there is a difference to me, the activity level in North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, mm. To me, it's almost like whatever's there is a little bit more bold. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe because you're in the mountains, you're tucked away. If you're living in flatlands, you really don't want to be drawing attention to yourself too much, you know. Um, but, you know, it's some interesting foot tracks and things. But, you know, I've only had the one sighting, which I myself now put into question because of how long ago it was. I've never had another sighting. Um, you know, I think that's a lucky thing for somebody to literally – have that kind of moment, you know, oh, you can absolutely. only hope for it. Yeah. Absolutely. And though, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. And Philip, keep me in, uh, keep me in the loop. If you ever run into any other interesting stuff and I'll have your, uh, uh, I do want listeners check out Philip's hot sauce. Dude, I like, I'm, I'm a hot sauce guy. I just started to get, oh, cool. I started to get into it over the last few years, just randomly. And like, we have some, we have some interesting stuff out in Iowa. It's not like the most crazy stuff like you guys have in the South, but, uh, dude, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of it. So listeners go check out, I'll have uh, the link in the show notes. So, uh, keep up the good well, work. I do Phillip. appreciate that. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, my, you know, I'm totally in the hot sauces, but I, I, the kind that I make are not melt your face off. They're enough to get your attention, but I'm really into having a lot of strong flavor in there. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right sir all right well thank you so much jeremiah and i'll i'll stay in touch with you 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 as well have a good night sir
You too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Here at Bigfoot Society, our goal is to provide a platform for those that have encountered Bigfoot to share their encounter in a safe and respected environment. But we need to hear your story. If you've experienced something that you just can't explain, please send me an email at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. Then we can start the conversation. I know a lot of you have not shared your encounter at all it's been 20 years and it's time that you get this off your chest and then you can get some well-deserved rest because i know you haven't been sleeping i understand what you're going through and i appreciate every one of you listening